Give everybody a moment to find their seats. We have just a, a few announcements we can can go over. Uh, part of this is in the handout. If you've got one of those, I'm not going to read everything on here, but please just pay attention to that and keep these folks in our prayer. One thing I do want to mention is congratulations to Johnny Britton and Jelena Blackwell as they got married on Wednesday. So God bless them. I hope that uh, Johnny's health will just get better. He's got a good helper there with him. So. He needed that. Uh, hope everybody got a good rain last night. I heard some folks over here say they got around three inches, so <laughs> probably washed a few <laughs> things out, but you can't complain about a good rain, I don't think. Uh, and Tessa's got a moat <laughs> around her. <laughs> so it didn't rain that much over in Hale Center, uh, but we got plenty of wind. We have a live oak. I mean, uh, a desert willow tree there by the house that just blooms and drops these little things all the time. And the ground was almost purple around it where it <laughs> knocked everything out of that tree. So there was some really good winds with that. Uh, as we get ready to put our minds towards uh, worshiping this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 18. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for rain. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the land that we live in that is plentiful. We pray, Lord, as, uh, as we go throughout our days and weeks that we don't forget how blessed we are to be in a place where we can freely worship lord we're in a place where we can say hi to our neighbors we can help our neighbors our neighbors can help us and it's it's just the way folks are everyone doesn't enjoy that kind of relationship and lord here in your church family we know that relationship's even stronger still that we're we're encouragement and we're strength to one another Lord, help us to always be that. Help us to be that in such a way that other folks see the love that we have for one another. And they say, I want to know about that. And we can tell them it's because we belong to Jesus. And that's how that people will know that we belong to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways you bless us. We pray, Lord, that you'll let us uh, keep our eyes open to every opportunity to serve. As we step out as a congregation to look for ways to serve our community as well as one another, please bless us with worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to read uh, John, first chapter 14, verse 14. This is kind of uh, God's covenant with the Lord Jesus uh, in this verse. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory of the Most High. Of the only begotten from the Father. Full of grace and truth. We'll back up to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received to him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Let us pray. Father, we know that You are the Most High. We're not worthy of you. But we know, Father, that you provided the the Lamb. The Lamb that was pure and golden and is pure the lamb that came to this earth the lamb that became flesh he provided the perfect lamb and father we we're to take, we're fixing to, to take this, this bread that we might examine ourselves and and that we, we may, may be true just like our Savior was.
And in his name we pray. Amen. We go to Ephesians, as Apostle Paul um, wrote this letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians 2 and 12. It says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of the promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you were formerly, were far off. Have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we know that, that you brought us near. We were so far off, but through your blood, as we just read in the scriptures, tells us that we finally, we knew that there was a plan, and the plan to send Jesus and shed his blood for us seal the covenant. Thank you, Father, for, for that sacrifice. We know that it's only words. Undescribable. But you, you see our hearts And help us to be joyful. For that's what you want for us. And we know, Father, that our Savior willingly done this for us. To bring us hope, to bring us closer. And, and um, completed his plan. We know, Father, that this is not the end. We know that from your scriptures. For we have an eternal life. Thank you again for his blood. And as we partake of this through the vine, that we will remember the ultimate sacrifice. And in his name we pray. Amen. Let's have the final prayer and, and uh, thank God for all the blessings. <clears throat> Father, you have given us an, an abundant life. And we know that from time to time uh, we're, we're guilty of, of not um, of thinking that we don't have an abundant life, but Forgive us for it. We know, Father, that you have blessed us so much. And help us to, to give according to how you've prospered us, according to, to the riches that you have given us. 
Father, we just thank you so much for all the blessings. You gave us so much. And help us that we might continually, continually uh, praise your holy name for all the blessings you give us. And in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. I think it's good to be back. Uh, for those that are friends on Facebook, uh, you've traveled with us through Wyoming and Montana uh, and Idaho, and we had a, a fantastic time. One of the prayers uh, went to a friend's house in Idaho, and, and her husband prayed a couple of times before we ate. And his prayer was that. Uh, as we saw the beauty around us that we would hear God uh, and we would understand God's powerful love. Uh, and so on the last night in, in Montana, uh, I looked up as the storms were coming in uh, and the sky opened up and you could see beyond the first layer of storm clouds to the white clouds beyond above that and beyond that the dark blue. Um, and I was reminded of God's love for us. Uh, and it was an amazing uh, time and amazing experience. I'd love to share all that with you. But we're in Luke chapter 23. And I want to share with you God's amazing love. Um, Luke 23 is the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. We tend to look at this at Easter. Uh, but we've been working our way through Luke. And I started to skip this because we go through this at Easter. But we need to hear it anew. And we need to hear it fresh. And we need to hear it not at Easter. Because I think a lot of times when we hear about the crucifixion of Jesus, we think about, here's what Jesus did for me. Uh, and he, he was willing to sacrifice his life on my behalf uh, for my forgiveness. And suddenly it becomes a very selfish thing on my part. That I get to reap all the benefits of what Jesus has done. And, and when I'm reading through Luke, if, I, if I'm able to ignore the chapters and the verses... And I'm able to listen to it as Luke wrote it, which is one thing, one long story that starts out with him talking to Theophilus saying, I've examined these things and I've researched these things and I've gathered the stories and I'm putting them all in one place so that you know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. And I start listening to the themes that Luke has for us. They are themes of surrender. They are themes of giving. They are themes of sacrifice. Not merely Jesus saying, this is what I came to do. But Jesus says a, a few times, if you're paying attention, and I think if we were listening to this all as one long monologue, that someone was reading to us, we would pick up on this theme quite readily. That if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be one of my followers, you must deny yourself, take up a cross, and follow me daily. And if I've heard that theme, and I've picked up on that theme as I've heard Luke, the, uh, the, Luke's record of Jesus' life, and I get to this point, my ears pick up a, a little bit different message than just how blessed I am. But they pick up this, this theme of, if you would follow after me, this is what it looks like. So I want to read chapter 23. I want us to hear it and think about it. Not as merely, and, and don't hear me say this is not about forgiveness because yes, this is about forgiveness. But if we leave it at that, we miss the beauty of what's happening. I want us to hear it as the culmination of Luke telling us this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. 
This is the end point of his teaching for us. And this is his teaching for us. This is what it looks like to be my disciple. If you go back into chapter 22, verse 66, it says, At daybreak the council of the elders of the people. This is a group of men, uh, highly trained, highly educated. Um, if, if you were before this court, you would be in awe of these people. So when we get to verse 20, uh, chapter 23, verse 1, it's going to say, Then the whole assembly. That means this court of high-ranking Supreme Court justices, for lack of a better term, this whole authoritative assembly is going to rise and go with Jesus. Okay. So chapter 23, beginning in verse 1. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Yes, it is as you say. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about, from what he had heard from about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice, they cried out, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Pilate that is. Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. That's from Hosea. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right 
the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. And the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. I'm going to stop there. Can we hear this fresh? Can we hear it new? Can we see the assembly of the religious rulers? the ones who make decisions on behalf of the whole nation. Can we see them in their, in their dress? These men who are supposed to be so dignified, can we see them vehemently questioning Jesus? Can we see them, can we see the highest court in the land lying about a man? bringing accusation against him. They bring him to Pilate. Here's the charge. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. Do you remember this question? Uh, if it were happening in real time, it wasn't very long before this event that they came to Jesus and asked this question, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said, show me a coin. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. And they accuse him. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. He claims to be Christ, a king. I love this. He, he claims to be a king. And Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, it's as, as you say. And Pilate says, oh, I'm good. There's, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. Hands him back. But these men, this court... Says he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He's stirring the people up. He started in Galilee. He's come all the way here. And then Pilate gets very happy because he hears, oh, he's a Galilean, so we'll send him to Herod. Now, I've always pictured what happened next as being a Roman thing. But it wasn't a Roman thing. Herod talks to Jesus uh, Herod's kind of excited to see Jesus because he's heard about the miracles and he wants to see some miracles. And he questions Jesus with all the chief priests, all this ruling council, standing there, vehemently accusing him. And then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. 
Herod, who wanted to see Jesus, begins to ridicule and mock Jesus. Not Roman soldiers. They dress him in an elegant robe. In their mockery of who Jesus is. And the amazing thing is Jesus remains silent. This is such an odd picture of Jesus that he would remain silent. I, I know that we, we've heard this so much that we're not shocked by it. But if you're just reading through Luke without all the chapters and verses, Jesus does a lot of talking. And there are a lot of times that people challenge him. There are a lot of times that people ask questions. And when he is challenged and when he is asked questions, Jesus always responds. And he always responds in a way that leaves those who are questioning and accusing dumbfounded. It leaves the audience amazed at his teaching and they want to hear more. And so this accusation that's brought to Jesus about, he says we shouldn't be paying taxes to Caesar, he's dealt with it. He could have said something here. He could have said something profound, I'm pretty sure, that would have caused Pilate not only to release him, but to find fault with the ones that were bringing charges against him. And yet when he could have done this great profound teaching to save himself, he remained silent. Don't marvel and awe at Jesus on this. Don't, don't read this and say, oh man, Jesus is so amazing. When they brought accusation against him, he remained silent. Guess what? He expects us to be like this. We live in a country and in a time where everybody is shouting about my rights. And Jesus, in a time when he could have stood up for his rights, stayed silent. And in doing so, he showed us this is what it means to love God. This is what it means to love your neighbor. Remember, he asked for this cup to be taken from him. He asked for a pass. He asked for a different way. Could God have not found a different way? I believe he probably could. I believe he could have found a different way to forgive people than by allowing Jesus to die. But he didn't. And so Jesus, in loving his Father and in loving the people when he could have stood up for his rights, remained silent and showed a different way, not for us to say, man, he's awesome, but to show us what it looks like to follow in his steps. And maybe we, as Christ followers, need to spend a little more time in silence. As we were singing that last song on Zion's glorious summit stood, there's that place where you sing holy and then there's a rest. We want to rush through the rest, but there's something powerful about singing holy and silence. Holy. Silence. And sadly, we live in a time where Christians have been yelling so much that no one wants to hear our message anymore. No one wants to walk with Jesus because we've been so loud. 
and our shouting doesn't look like what Jesus did. And so they just keep yelling and screaming about Jesus. Pilate tries to release him. Pilate even says, look, I will, I will beat him. I will have him punished. It's going to be really bad for him. But I'll have him punished and then we can release him. Let's just do it that way. And they said, no, we want him killed. And Jesus remained silent. And Pilate said, there's no reason for this. I, I, there's no legal grounds for us to kill him. This is illegal. And they said, no, we want him crucified. And Jesus remained silent. And that group of men in charge of the spiritual direction of Israel were so persuasive that Pilate, a Roman governor, finally decided to do what they asked and sent Jesus away to be crucified. On the way, Jesus sees women who are mourning him, and he stops. He stops and turns to them, and, and he comforts them. Don't wait for me. You need to understand what's about to happen. If they are willing to do this now, can you imagine what they're going to do later? Can you imagine what's going to happen later on if they're willing to kill me now? I think he's probably talking about those who follow me are going to experience worse stuff than this. Those who walk in my steps are going to face a lot of hardship and persecution and torture and death. That's what it means to walk in my steps. That's what it means to deny yourself daily. Take up your cross and follow me. And then Luke tells us about the other two criminals. And he simply, he does not give us all the details. He just said, there they crucified him along with the other two. For those in that first century who are reading this or hearing this for the first time, they knew what that meant. They could see the pictures. They could smell the smells. They could hear the sounds of crucifixion. And so Luke didn't include all of those. These events didn't happen in the span of a sentence. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus prays. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When's the last time you prayed that? When's the last time we as a church prayed that? We fill our prayers with, Father, forgive me. And, and God's already said, look, I, I forgive you. <laughs> I've done that. Jesus was my forgiveness for you. You've accepted him. And the promise of baptism is that you are forgiven. And we still, asking, we, we still keep asking God to forgive us. But when's the last time we said, Father, forgive them? Did you know that if you are willing to forgive other people, your desire to yell and scream about them goes way down. <laughs> that if you're willing to forgive other people, that voice that, start, that keeps yelling about my rights, my rights, my rights, suddenly goes silent. If I'm willing to forgive them, My stress goes down. I smile more. I'm much more pleasant to be around.
Jesus is teaching us something very important. He's living out the command love God, love each other. And perhaps this is one of the greatest things we can learn. We tend to want God to forgive people while we maintain a grudge. It's okay for us if God forgives them, but I've got to hang on to my hatred and my anger. Because after all, they deserve it. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Do you realize the people that crucified Jesus were forgiven for that sin and that crime, for that murder? They were forgiven before it ever happened. What if we were people that did that? That started praying for their forgiveness instead of mine. Being thankful for the forgiveness that I have so that I can sing about God's grace and being willing to forgive those that don't know what they're doing. Jesus' greatest teaching happened on that last day in the span of a few hours where he didn't say a whole lot but he demonstrated something very important. I was thinking about sacrifice. I wondered about taking that animal to the temple, to the priest, and placing your hand on the head of that animal and that animal being slaughtered. What effect would that have on the people who went to sacrifice? Do, do you walk away from that and say, man, I'm glad that's over, and go eat a meal and, and nothing has changed? I think that's the way I have treated Jesus' sacrifice a lot of times. Man, I'm so glad Jesus was willing to die for me so that I can live however I want to. I'm glad Jesus was willing to do this so that I don't have to. That's not why Jesus did this. That's not the example that he gave us. That's not the teaching he left with us. All of his teaching says... Following my steps. Do as I'm doing. Say as I'm saying. And I think the sacrifice, if you're offering the animal, the fact that you have to take an animal to the temple says something went wrong. Jesus going to the cross says something went wrong. And if I realize that something has gone wrong, and all I say is, but I'm forgiven. And it doesn't change me. I've missed the point of the sacrifice. I've missed the point of the cross. Father, forgive us because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Help us be people who live out a different lifestyle, a different ethic. That's going to be my prayer this week. Every chance I get, I want to pray, Father, forgive them. 
instead of getting mad at that person for whatever it is, and most of the stuff we get mad about is a pretty small deal, I want to pray that prayer, Father, forgive them. And believe that he has. When I'm, when I'm reminded of someone who has done me wrong, I want to pray, Father, forgive them. And believe that he did. So that I don't carry around that weight, that burden, any longer. If someone says something negative or mean or accuses me of something this week, I want to remain silent. When I'm tempted to demand my rights, I want to be quiet. I want to invite you on that journey too, not because I think it's some great thing, but because that's just what Jesus asked us to do. If you would come after me, anyone who would come after me must deny themselves, take up a cross, and follow me daily. I want to try that this week. I'd love for you to walk with me. You may have a need this morning. Uh, maybe there's some forgiveness that you need to be praying about. You want to pray with somebody uh, that might can hold you accountable. Mike could give you a hug. We're going to give you that opportunity in just a little bit. Uh, our elders that are here are going to be somewhere on the outside of the auditorium uh, after our word of prayer in just a little bit. You're welcome to go to, to them during the song that we sing after that. Uh, they would love to pray with you. Uh, if there's another way that we can help you, this is certainly not just about prayer, uh, but we want to help you as best we can. Uh, we don't have all the answers. Um, but we have a lot of love. We're willing to walk with you and try to find answers. And sometimes we just, there's not an answer. We live day to day and we walk in faith. It may be this morning that you're ready to submit to this lifestyle that Jesus gave us. You're ready to be baptized. And we would certainly uh, love to walk into the waters with you this morning uh, and and allow you to experience that rebirth. So if you have a need this morning, we want, we want to encourage you uh, to let that need be known. It may be that you turn to someone in a pew next to you and say, hey, I've got, I've got a need. I need some help. I need some prayer. So you can do that as well. So I'm going to ask that you be standing. Our elders and their wives are going to make their way to the outside of the auditorium. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then Clint's going to lead us in a closing song after that. For the past two weeks, Father, you have humbled me with your beauty, uh, with the beauty of your creation. You have allowed me to experience things that I've never seen before, and I'm thankful for that. You've also allowed me to spend a couple of weeks on one chapter thinking about the love that you've shown us and the example that Jesus gave us as he was on trial and as he was condemned and mocked and as he was led to that place where he was crucified. And that's far more beautiful than the vast beauty that I saw over the past few weeks. I thank you for his example. I thank you for his sacrifice. But Father, I have not lived up to that. And as he has called us to walk daily, denying ourselves and taking up a cross, I pray that you would give me strength this week to do that. And as he prayed, Father, forgive them, I also pray, Father, forgive them. Teach me this week 
to be more forgiving, to forgive at every opportunity, to truly forgive, and to forgive again and again. Father, as I leave this place, change me. Make me different. And allow me to be used by your spirit this week to touch the lives of others that need to know of your love. For it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Alleluia to the King of kings. Alleluia to the Lamb. Alleluia to the 